Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? And that's what we're here to find out. Today, we return to the Listener Library for a suggestion from our mysterious listener, Scott, who sent us an episode of Suspense called Fugue in C Minor. One of radio's most prestigious and longest-running shows, Suspense premiered on CBS in 1942 and continued to thrill audiences until its final broadcast in 1962. The show quickly gained reputation for its mastery of the genre, attracting some of radio's greatest talents, including the stars of today's episode, Vincent Price and Ida Lupino. In 1944, the name Vincent Price was not yet synonymous with the horror genre. Price was predominantly known as a character actor. His closest brush with horror was a lead role in Universal's 1940 hit, The Invisible Man Returns. During this period, Price was far more likely to play a historical figure than a murderous madman. In the span of a few years, he played King Charles II, Joseph Smith, founder of Mormonism, and William McAdoo, President Woodrow Wilson's Secretary of the Treasury. His breakout film role would come a few months after the broadcast of Fugue in C Minor, playing the shallow, sophisticate Shelby Carpenter in Otto Preminger's film noir masterpiece, Laura. In the 1940s, listeners were more likely familiar with Ida Lupino than Vincent Price. Lupino was a trailblazer, beginning her career as an actor in such classic films as The Sea Wolf and High Sierra, before stepping behind the camera to become one of Hollywood's earliest female directors. In 1953, Lupino co-wrote and directed The Hitchhiker, widely regarded as the first American film noir helmed by a woman and was the second woman to be admitted into the Directors Guild of America. Fugue in C Minor was written by Lucille Fletcher, author of two of Suspense's most famous scripts, Sorry Rung Number and The Hitchhiker, no relation to the Ida Lupino film. The title, Fugue in C Minor, refers to the musical composition by Johann Sebastian Bach, which, as you will hear, plays an important part in the story. That's a lot of talent packed into a single episode of Old Time Radio. So what are we waiting for? Let's listen to Fugue in C Minor from Suspense, originally broadcast June 1st, 1944. It's late at night, and a chill has set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from your speaker. Listen to the music, and listen to the voices. Roma Wine presents Suspense. Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wine toasts the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. The Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, welcomes you again to this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you as stars Miss Ida Lupino, currently being seen in Warner Brothers in our time, and Mr. Vincent Price of 20th Century Fox, soon to be seen in the Daryl F. Zanuck production, Wilson. For the appearance of these two distinguished screen personalities, Lucille Fletcher has written a suspense play that deals with brooding anxiety and sharpening suspicion, played against the severe and forbidding background of the late Victorian era. And so, with Fugue in C minor, and with the performances of Ida Lupino and Vincent Price, we again hope to keep you in suspense. First, 1900. 
Dear Bessie, this is just to let you know that I arrived in Pilotsville. Lizzie met me at the station. She's heartbroken about Papa's bankruptcy and for some reason feels that it's up to me to remedy the family situation. I told her I'd been offered a job, but she swept away that idea in horror. A girl with your looks, Amanda Peabody, doesn't have to get a job. There are too many rich husbands floating around for that. Furthermore, she says she has a rich husband already picked out for me right here in Pilotsville. Don't you remember? I told you about him at Christmas time. He's a Mr. Evans, rich as Croesus, charming, cultured, a lonely widower with two dear little children. And besides that, he's just your type, a real intellectual. You should hear him play the pipe organ. And you know, Bessie, I've met so few interesting men lately. And all you'd have to do is lift your little finger. Mr. Evans. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Chumley. How delightful to see you here. I'd like you to meet my sister. Mr. Evans, my sister, Amanda Peabody. Delighted, I'm sure. It's a lovely party, Mr. Evans. Thank you, Miss Peabody. Have you just come to Pilotsville? Yes. Uh, she's down from New York visiting me after the whirl of the hectic social season. Oh, indeed. <laughs> well, I'm afraid our Pilotsville society must seem a bit dull to you, Miss Peabody. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. It's charming. I've enjoyed everything so much tonight. Your beautiful house, the music. I hear you're going to play for us, Mr. Evans. Oh, a bit. Do you care for organ music, Miss Peabody? Oh, very much. I never miss a church recital. But what a luxury it must be to have your own pipe organ right here in the house. I'm afraid I couldn't do without it. It's my hobby, you know. Bach, Buxtehude, César Frank. Don't you adore their work? Oh, Amanda's very musical. You should hear her render the burning of Rome. <laughs> yes. And the delightful thing, of course, about having a pipe organ in the house is that it's everywhere. To sit at a keyboard and hear the walls, the ceilings, the floors vibrate. You see, Miss Peabody, I've had the pipes installed all over the house. Under this floor, for example, are all the choir stops. Up in the bedroom walls are the stops for the swell manual. In the great uh, 32-foot pedal stops, the giant diapasons are underneath the staircase. My children sleep next door to the echo chamber. <laughs> so, you see, we live like angels here in a paradise of music. How thrilling. Now, ladies, come upstairs to the second floor landing, won't you? And I'll show you the console. It was made for me in Vienna. dear, to tell you the truth, I really find him fascinating. I wish you could hear him play. It sweeps you off your feet. There is such wildness to it, and at the same time, such dignity. And to hear the sound all through that marvelous house, rolling through those gorgeous rooms with their beautiful tapestries and potted palms. I could sit and listen to him all night. You have the most amazing eyes, Miss Peabody. What are you thinking about? The music. Oh, please don't stop. It's so beautiful. Well, you seem to be as mad about music as I am. Your sister says you play, too. <laughs> oh, no, only a little. My appreciation of it is all inside, I'm afraid. That's plenty. If one can't play, it's better just to enjoy the music of others. I can't bear this sentimental drumming, can you? I shouldn't think you would enjoy it. The idiotic tunes people play nowadays. Give me the old stern classics. They have strength and power. Give me something with life to it. Something that will flood the whole... Marvelous. You're a very unusual girl, Miss Peabody. Quite unlike the run of girls here down here at Pilotsville. Yes, in what way? Oh, it's rather hard to explain. Uh, some more tea, Amanda. No, thank you. A muffin? No, thank you. You have an excellent cook, Mr. Evans. Please, please call me Theodore. You know you promised. Theodore? Amanda. And your house is beautifully run, too. You must have an excellent housekeeper. Everything always looks so charming and quiet. I haven't even heard a peep out of your children. My children? Oh, yes, the children have been away at school. 
You have two, haven't you? Yes, Daphne and David. What sweet names. Ordinarily, I don't approve of schools for young children, but you see, they were rather overwrought. After Mrs. Evans passed on... Oh, I can well understand. They were almost morbidly devoted to their mother, and then, of course, the unfortunate circumstances of her death, but <laughs> I suppose your sister, Mrs. Chumley, has told you all about that. No, not very much, except... Your wife was killed in a street accident, wasn't she? Yes, in Philadelphia, a brewery wagon and four horses ran her down. Oh, how terrible. It's something I don't like to think about very often. Poor, beautiful Margaret. Well, it's like a nightmare, Amanda, and I still can't feel reconciled, but... Well, what I was driving at was the children. They were in school when she died, and by some malicious stroke of fate, there was an epidemic of scarlet fever raging out there... The authorities wouldn't lift the quarantine and let them out for her funeral. Oh, poor little thing. Yes, it upset them dreadfully. In fact, I sometimes fear it's left a mark on them which may endure all their lives. Why, what do you mean? They suffer from delusions. Delusions about her. They think that in some way she is linked. Her soul is imprisoned in the organ pipes. How horrible. I wish I could do something about it. It's a frightful notion, but they won't... They don't let me play when they're at home... That echo chamber in particular next door to their bedroom. Yes. You know, it's nothing but an empty sealed room with a few wires. Of course, it's all because they never saw her dead. But they have a notion that she's, well, somehow hidden there. How oh, ghastly. They really think that, do they? Children can think up such very strange things in their little minds. Can't they? Night for suspense. Roma Wines are bringing you as stars Miss Ida Lupino and Mr. Vincent Price, whom you have heard in the prologue to Fugue in C Minor. Tonight's tale of suspense. Let us look in on another scene for a moment. A smart dinner party at the internationally famous Hotel de Nacional de Cuba in Havana. One of the guests, a world-traveled American, sets down his wine glass and remarks that a truly fine wine always carries the unmistakable flavor of the particular vineyard from which it comes. Well, then laughs his Cuban host, you must be homesick for California right now. For the wine you are enjoying so much is from America, from California. It is Roma wine. Yes, it's true. Our own wonderful vineyard country in California produces in Roma... Wines that discriminating people in other lands esteem as an imported delicacy. Yet you here at home can enjoy these distinguished Roma wines for mere pennies a glassful. You pay none of the expensive overseas shipping charges and duties. Daily with your meals or when entertaining or any time, you can delight yourself with the wonderful flavor that comes from age-old winemaking traditions perfected by modern quality controls and tests. Yes, only pennies a glass full for a treat you are certain to enjoy. For remember, Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. Roma, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our sound stage Ida Lupino as Amanda Peabody and Vincent Price as Theodore Evans in Fugue in C Minor. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. April 18th. I met the children today, Bessie, for the first time. It was a shock. Yes, strange little creatures like their father. The girl is about 11 and the boy 8. They were both dressed in deep mourning. Their large gray eyes seemed strained with terror. They listened and trembled at every sound. This is Miss Peabody, children. She's a very good friend of mine. Now I want you both to shake hands with her. Oh, come now, Daphne. You can at least tell Miss Peabody how old you are. Oh, no. Please don't press her. 
I know when I was a little girl, I hated people to talk about my age. I'd much rather hear about, well, about school. We're not going back there. No matter what anybody says. David. That's all right. Then you didn't like school. No. And Mommy didn't like it either. She cried when we went away. Oh. But your Mama wanted you to be educated, didn't she? She wanted you to grow up and be intelligent people, didn't she? Well, didn't she, Daphne? Who are you? You may call me Aunt Amanda. I'm a friend of your Papa's. Do you know where my Mama is? Your Mama? Well, your Mama's in heaven, dear. No, she's not. Then where is she, dear? Please, please don't start them off, Amanda. It's too upsetting. Come along, children. Now we're going to have a little music, like old times. You remember when your mother was alive? We all used to play together. David, you with your cornet and Daphne at the violin, and Mama at the piano. Well, Miss Peabody plays the piano, too. She's promised to play Narcissus, Mama's favorite piece. Well? Well, perhaps some other time, Theodore, when they don't feel so strange. I tell you, I've humored them to death. Now, come, David. There's your cornet on the mantelpiece. And Daphne? No. I insist. Look, now, I'll start the melody on the organ. David, you come in with your cornet obbligato in the third measure. Daphne, you can follow me. So that's just a cipher. A wire must have stuck somewhere. One of the pipe valves. It's Mama. That's where Mama is. She's calling for it. Oh, don't be silly. I just hit the key a few times and it'll stop. You've heard these ciphers before, haven't you, Miss Peabody? Well, I don't know much about pipe It's organs. a common technical occurrence, but very annoying, of course. What is she doing in there? Why doesn't it stop? That's where she is. She's in the pipe and she can't get out. Daphne, stop that nonsense. Oh, hush, dear. Your papa will fix it. No, he won't. He can't. Because he killed her. Daphne. Daphne, what did you say? Oh, she didn't mean it, I'm sure. The poor little thing's hysterical. <laughs> we should never have tried to persuade them. Oh, man. Just because they never looked upon her face, because they never saw her lying there in the coffin. Oh, hush, hush. My own children believe that I am a murderer. Theodore, you're making them both sick. So I, I who loved their mother so much, who was so devoted for 12 years. Do I look like a murderer, Amanda? Do I? No. There it is again. It's Mama. It's Mama. Shh, dear. I'll take them upstairs for you, Theodore, while you try and fix it. April 24th. Oh, Bessie. Those poor little children, we took them out to the cemetery today to show them her grave. A marble angel guarded it. It was planted with pure white tulips. How final it was and peaceful. And yet they began to tremble again the moment we set foot inside the house. Poor Theodore. The man is nearly out of his mind. What can he do? I keep asking myself that question. What can he do? She died in Philadelphia, you say? Yes, on May 15th, just a little less than a year ago. You weren't with her? No, she went there to take a piano lesson. There was a new teacher she'd heard about. She was always so self-conscious about her technique. But she never reached his studio. They notified me at midnight from the city morgue. And no one in Philadelphia saw her? No one except the attendants at the morgue, of course, and the people who picked her up after the collision. It was such a brutal accident. There'd be no one from among them who could speak to the children, explain to them. Oh, no. Oh, it's so horrible, so sordid. Oh, I know, my dear. I hate to make you suffer. But if we could find some way, if they could just believe. When you brought her back here to Pilotsville, there was a funeral. Yes. And was there anybody then who saw her? Oh, no, I couldn't bear it, man, I... I didn't think at the time she'd been so beautiful. Her lovely, sweet, gentle face and her eyes. The horses had completely trembled. Oh. 
Even if the children had been able to come home, I wouldn't have let them look. The coffin was sealed when I left Philadelphia. I didn't want to see her again myself. But there was a funeral. People came. There were flowers and undertakers. Yes. Well, if they could believe that, if there was one witness, perhaps my own sister lived. There was a funeral, the finest funeral in town. A snow white hearse and 25 coaches. Everybody sent flowers. The casket wasn't open, but I've been to lots of funerals where they don't open the casket. And from what I understand, she was pretty badly mangled. But it was a beautiful funeral. Mr. Evans played the organ himself, the finest selections, all the sweet old pieces his wife liked. There was Narcissus and Mighty Lack of Rose and. Goodbye forever. The way it was. So you see, David, my sister, Mrs. Chomley, was there. Yes, but how did she know it was Mama? Oh, David. Uh... She didn't see Mama, did she? Well, nobody saw your poor Mama, dear. She wouldn't have wanted anyone to see her. Mama wasn't there. She talks to us every night. She tells us to look for her. Where, dear? In the pipe. But, David, your mama's dead. She's been dead for nearly a year. Now, you saw her grave out in the cemetery. She's happy and at rest. Why doesn't Papa give us the key? If he'd only let us have it, we could look for her. What key, dear? The key's to the pipe. There's a little door just underneath the stairs. That's where they... That's where the big pipes are. And inside it's all dark. But where are the... But there are... There are tunnels. There's a little room. A little room. room. That's where she's hiding. That's where Mommy is. That's where Mommy is. Oh, David, darling, now look, come here. No, I hate you. But why do you hate me? Why don't you let me help you? Because... Because what? Because... You like him. Him? Papa, you're going to marry him, aren't you? Why? <laughs> yes, you are. Sophia says you are. You're going to marry him. Then you'll send us back to school. There'll be no one left to help Mama. Poor Mama will never be left out. Oh, I hate you. I hate you. David, what are you doing here? David, did you strike Miss Peabody? He's sick, Theodore. I'm sure he's very sick. Now go to your room at once. Oh, those dreadful children. I tell you, Amanda, they'll ruin whatever happiness we might have. Theodore, I love you very much. But I couldn't marry you. Not with that child's cry ringing in my head. We've got to help them. Give them that key. Let them go and look in the room where the pipes are. Then they'll see for themselves that there's no ghost. Key? Who told you about a key to that room? The children. The children? Amanda, I'm going to tell you something. Something I've temper- never told to a living soul. It, it may frighten you. Yes. Margaret was going mad when she died. Oh. No one knew it but me. It ran in her family. I discovered it long after we were married. After the children were born. Otherwise, I'd never... Have... And now you think the children? I'm afraid so. It was peopling of sound she had, just like them, a fear of the dead's returning. She used to play... What's that? Sounds like the organ. But the motor isn't on. The console was locked when I left. Someone's trying to play. No one but me can touch that instrument. It's forbidden in this house and the servants are out. Unless those children come upstairs, man. Why, there's no one here. No one at the keyboard. The organ's playing itself. That's impossible. The motor's not going. The motor? Yes, except the bellows going. There's no air in the pipes unless it's on. No air to make the pipes speak. It's impossible, I tell you. Perhaps the children found the key and got in. The key? No, no, no. The key's here in my pocket. There's no other way. No. Theodore, open that door. Go in there and see what's happening, please. No. Theodore. I won't give in. I... I won't be a prey to it. Do you hear? I, I won't. I, I won't. I won't. Here. It stopped now. 
Yes. It was probably nothing but the wind. Theodore, give me the key. I'm not afraid. Are you saying that I am? I don't know. But I'll be fair with you, Theodore. I couldn't marry you and live here with that any more than your children can. What do you mean? Rip out those pipes. Rip out the whole pipe organ. Give it to a church, but don't keep it here. Get rid of it's the pipe worth... organ? Yes. But I couldn't. The whole house was built around it. It's been the very soul and spirit of this home. It's been the curse, you mean. Theodore, I know I'd go mad, too, if I had to listen to it night and day. It's so hollow. Think of those pipes so huge down there in the darkness. I begin to hear things, too. Oh, here. Quiet. Be quiet. Come outside. We'll take a walk. No. No, give me the key. Give me the key. It's hysterical, Amanda. I'm sorry I've overburdened you. Why don't you want to go in there? Is it because you know something? You did something. What do you mean? Did you kill her? Amanda. <laughs> Very well, Amanda. Here's the key. If that's the way you trust me, we'll go down and look around together. Come now, Amanda. I'm sorry, Theodore. It slipped out. It was a dreadful thing to say. All right, I understand. Yet it hurts a little. I've trusted you so completely, Amanda. Theodore. Yes, Amanda. Let's not go in there. I do trust you, darling. I, I, I believe everything you've told me. No. <laughs> this little key. To think it should mean so much. Black it is. Yes, pitch black. And cold. Where are the pipes? I can't see them. Come in further, Amanda. You'll see them as soon as your eyes grow accustomed to the darkness. The biggest pipes pack this well under the great staircase like giants. Oh, yes. I'm beginning to see them now. Shouldn't we go and get a candle? Oh, no, no. Go in a little further. Be careful. The floor is a maze of wires. Now stand there for a second. Theodore... Don't leave me. I won't be long. I thought you said you weren't afraid. So I'm not only... Where are you going? Just upstairs to play for you. Theodore. I'd like you to hear how the music sounds in the darkness. It's quite an experience being so close to the pipes. You know, narrow, suffocating, especially when I pay the great Passacaglia and Fugue of Bach. Oh, Theodore, please. I don't want to stay here. Perhaps one of the Rheinberger symphonies or the great chorales of César Frank. (laughs) Margaret, of course, preferred Narcissus. Margaret? You're very gullible, Amanda. Then you did kill her. You killed her in this room. And you're going to kill me. Yes, simple, isn't it? But why? I don't why? know. One gets tired every now and then of mere music. Sometimes the classics demand competition. A scream, for example. There's something so exciting about pulling out all the stops and drowning out all human sound. Have you ever tried to match your voice, Miss Peabody, against the thunderous voice of Bach? It's most effective. And then when the struggle gets weaker, when the air is almost gone and you choke and gasp for breath... To bring the music down, softer, softer. Theodore, you're mad, you're mad. Come, Amanda, would you deny me that pleasure? No, I Help. promise you the concert Help. will be too long. It takes about eight hours before the air gives out. But you know, I could play for days. And don't worry about the children. I think you've convinced them about the ghost. But that? Theodore? Someone shut the door. It's locked and the key's outside. Who's there? Let me out. Let me out! Get away from me. Let me out, do you hear? Let me out, let me out! I can't breathe! I'm suffocating, it's so dark, I can't breathe! Let me out, please, please! I can't breathe, I can't... No, 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 I can't, I can't let... Let me out, I can't breathe! Oh, oh.
1st, 1900. I shall be coming home in a few days, Betty. I still can't sleep at night. I still hear that laughter. I still hear that cornet playing its unearthly music. And Theodore Evans once more lies dead at my feet. It was his heart, Betty. He died of fright. In those few moments, he anticipated the hideous fate he had meted out to so many. And I might have died there if he had not gone so quickly. But the children hated me. They wanted to kill us both. Those terrible, pathetic children. What horrors they must have sensed in that charnel house. There were other women beside his wife. He found them all buried and stuffed away into unused parts of the pipe organ. Yes, see, I was in that pipe room alone with him for four hours before that door creaked open. There they stood. And I shall never forget their faces or the things they said. Why, you see, buddy? You can come out now if you're really sorry. I'm sorry. Are you sure he's quite dead? Yes, he's dead. We were right all the time. Weren't we, Miss Peabody? Yes, you were right. Now, will you come and help us find Mama? And so closes Fugue in C Minor, starring Miss Ida Lupino and Vincent Price. Tonight's tale of... Suspense! Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Of all the rich treasures man gets from the earth and Mother Nature, none has been more highly esteemed than wine. Good, delicious wine. And if you are one who does not yet know how much and how delightfully Roma wines add to your meals, well, let me urge you not to miss out any longer on such a treat as this. There's nothing complicated about it. Just get and serve Roma wine with any meal or any time in any kind of glass you wish. Serve it chilled. Try the many different kinds of Roma wine until you find those you like best of all. Try Roma California Sherry with its wonderful nut-like flavor as an appetizer. Or Ruby Red Roma Burgundy. Or the deliciously delicate flavored Roma Sauterne. These superb wines cost you only pennies a glassful. And yet, they make even the simplest meal taste like a million dollars. Get some today. And if your dealer is temporarily out of Roma, please try again soon. You owe it to yourself to have and regularly enjoy... R-O-M-A, Roma Wine, America's largest selling wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Ida Lupino. Mr. Spear has just been telling me a little about next week's suspense show. The star will be Thomas Mitchell in a story about a man who had headaches, tried everything to cure them, finally went to a psychiatrist and found out that he was a murderer. Well, that certainly sounds like a broadcast we listeners won't want to miss. One more word. Don't forget to buy that war bond this week. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Thomas Mitchell and Donald Crisp in... Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. That was Fugue in C Minor from Suspense here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. And that was a listener request coming to us from Scott, who sent us that episode. Thank you, Scott. (laughs) Thank you, Scott. First of all, Suspense, once again, wow, man, it's a good series. Damn near perfect. Um, This particular one has its moments where I went, ooh, 
is it finally going to be a suspense where you go, yeah, but man, does it pull it out at the end <laughs> for me. I just like, wow, that really picked up pace and steam and got really good. So before we just start tiptoeing around, that was super enjoyable. I love this one. Mm-hmm. It will, for reasons we shall discuss, but mm-hmm. uh, it also is a nostalgic episode for me because I had this as a young kid on a cassette tape, and one side was the house in Cypress Canyon, and the oh, other side. Oh, you the other side. The other side. Yeah, this like, is the one you've been talking about for yeah. years. This was the one on the other side. Yeah, the other side. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, the house in Cypress Canyon was the very first episode of this podcast. Yes, yeah. and he's been saying... Since then, that was the cassette tape, and on the other side was something else. You can see minor. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful uh, cassette tape. You still have that? No, it's lost to time. I know what you're getting for Christmas. <laughs> A media you can't play anymore. <laughs> it's not meant to be played. They're meant to be put in a shadow box frame <laughs> and looked at. Uh, it also demonstrates Lucille Fletcher's ability to change writing styles because she can write stuff that's very contemporary and almost film noir. And here is Lucille Fletcher very intentionally writing something in this very historical, gothic, florid mm-hmm. style. Yeah, I to write on coattails for both of you, going into this, the list of talent of this, I would, wow, I'm sure I'm going to love this. And going into it, like, well, maybe, I don't know, there's moments here. And Lucille Fletcher is the MVP here, as far as I'm concerned. Right. And just, wow, for the stylistic success she has with the script and being able to subvert the ending to be mm-hmm. something unexpected. Can we just jump to that ending? Yeah. The fact that the kids made her think about what she did for four hours before letting her out is, oh, oh. man. Yeah. That is a horrific moment of beautiful writing and that we find out from her later so when we hear her talking later you're just going and what happened what happened what happened you're alive i know that yeah or are you in a pipe are you writing this from an actual (laughs) organ pipe are you stuffed in a pipe those last few lines are so brilliant for exactly what you said she does this really frightening role reversal where those children are the parent Mm -hmm. and she's the child you can come out now if you're really sorry Yes, I'm sorry. And she just repeats exactly what they want to hear with each sentence. Mm -hmm. We were right all along, weren't Mm -hmm. we? Yes, you were right. That last line and the fact that they were willing to end on it of just the little boy's voice going, now will you come help us find Mama? Yeah. (laughs) It's like, whoa. There's also a great moment in the ending where for no reason at all, you don't even need it, but it was lovely to add into it. Oh, there were a lot of women, right? Oh, by the way, there was lots of them. (laughs) <laughs> there was a yeah, lot was, of women. I and couldn't they, quite parse out if that was before their mother or if it was while he was married and the wife was alive and the kids were just there. Like, dad kills people. I think the kids were there because the way she talks about it, I think she says something along the lines of, you know, what terrible things these children must have seen in this charnel house. Yeah. yeah. It, it implies that it had been going on for a long time. It's the, the slow burn of how messed up those kids are. Right. It's a brilliant job of not only performance by everybody to convey the idea of the plausibility of the kids are just not settled from having not seen their mother dead. Mm -hmm. Vincent Price's delivery of that. He doesn't do that thing where the bad guy is always like, you can tell they're the bad guy because of how the actor decides to play him Mm -hmm. with a, a wink. He plays it so earnestly. And let's give Fletcher credit for writing it that way, of course. But there is a certain point halfway through this where I'm like, what is the story here that these kids won't believe their mother's dead? Well, I was thinking going through it like, okay, the story is he killed their mother and he's hiding it and they know the truth and they'll uncover that and that's the story. But that's not the story. The story is these kids are traumatized and eventually going to kill people. Yes, themselves. Yeah. And that probably won't change. You get the idea that although Vincent Price is just making it up in the moment about the madness that runs in their family, he's when he tells Amanda that story, it's clearly this sort of last minute attempt to dissuade her from following this line of inquiry, but it ends up kind of becoming true. It's yeah. only they're they're getting it from their father's side, not their mother's. What an odd concept by the way to even fictionally imagine this in your head and write it a house built around an organ 
where it runs through the floorboards and through the walls. I don't know if this is true, but I read on one website, I think it was the Suspense Escape site, that Joseph Kearns had and, yeah. this house. I read it too. One of the original uh, actors to play the man in black. Hmm. That's not proven, right? I couldn't find anything more about that. that what a crazy idea. I'm willing to believe it because it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you imagine? It does, uh, among other things, that contributes to him being the worst father ever of... I play a pipe organ and everything in the house shakes. Yeah. <laughs> and they're right next to the echo chamber. Yes. Let's put the kids there. <laughs> they won't be talking about this in therapy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? And I had forgotten this. I haven't listened to this in about 15 years. And so as I'm listening to this, it's either like Tim says, it's okay, the husband has killed the wife and the children are true, but the children are performed in a creepy manner and they're so disturbed that you start to go, well, maybe it is the kids. And I feel like it's her writing this competition and what you don't see coming is that it's both of them. Yeah. It's not which one is it. Are the kids crazy? Is the husband crazy? They're both crazy. And I think that's the stroke of brilliance as well as how it's executed at the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. Did you guys uh, pick up on the line flub? Oh, several line flubs. And I wrote this yeah. down because... Which is rare in we talk, radio. Well, we talk all the time about, is it distracting when an adult is doing a kid's voice? And why don't they just go with a kid? And I, when that happened, the few times the kids were flubbing their lines and you can hear Ida Lupino yeah. trying to she feed them. She jumps in and is going to try to help. Try to help them on this live broadcast that I went... Right. This is why they made the option of can someone do a kid's voice because that's that scene is so striking because you it's so obvious when you listen to it of that like they're struggling to get this kid to make the lines work and at the end of that scene there's this big emotional outburst from the kid which is excellent. Yeah. The serendipity there is because it's a line in which the kid is emotionally breaking down. It works. I listened to it so much when I was younger. I never picked up on it. I just thought it was the kid right. breaking down and the Ida Lupino character trying to pull stuff out of him. It, it works, and it's not distracting enough to go, uh-oh. I wonder if something was going on in the studio, because Vincent Price also like just stumbles someone, over a line. Yeah, Like someone's just running around in their underwear? Yeah, it's probably because it's kids, and he's probably like, I hate children. <laughs> Get them out of the studio. <laughs> you know what I love about... There's a lot to love about this. The thing I love the most about this is when he is asked, why did you kill her? And he says... I don't know. <laughs> but the dying screams of a person sound, they're like music to him. And, uh, and, and that is just, just a phenomenal piece of horror writing. And, and this is Lucille Fletcher, you can tell. I mean, it's so well written, but it's over the top. And it's Lucille Fletcher going, I'm going to write this over the top. <laughs> like, But there's an understatement to yeah, asking I someone, yeah. I don't know. Just There's always a reason because she did this or that. You know, there's always that desire as a yeah. writer to write the reason why because yeah. it's what we want to know it's why we make people when they admit guilt tell us and tell us why why did you do this and when we don't get that answer we're really frustrated yeah. but he does kind of tell you just crazy sometimes the classics demand competition <laughs> right. and that is a great line right. and when he says that you can just imagine him like a madman sitting at that organ and some oh. shrieking in the background it's just a couple lines like that paint this horrific image and the wonderful huge image impact transitioning a little of that note that sticks when he plays that technical brilliance of it's the simplest sound effect in the world uh. <laughs> right and horrifyingly yeah. uh, scary right yeah. there's so much i think going on in that because on, on one level it's a red herring because it's suspense and they do sometimes do supernatural stories so that's mm -hmm. the part where you go maybe there yeah, is a real ghost, and maybe she mm -hmm. really does live in the pipes, like the children are saying. And then there's also just this nice idea of like a bizarro organ sting in old time radio. Because what happens <laughs> is it gets stuck, right? And the kids are freaking out, and they say, It's mother, it's mother. And they finally, I think it's the boy who says, Father killed her, and it goes away. Right. And it's <laughs> a silent sting, is essentially <laughs> what it is. And that's beautiful. This is why I'm going to argue with you. I believe this is a supernatural episode of suspense. I do believe sure. Yeah, I think that one was ambiguous. When they get to when it plays without the motor going, that's harder to read either way. And the kids say they're talking to her, and I, I, I read it as she is, her spirit's in there and communicating with them and running the organ, and that's why it stops when the truth comes out. And as Tim said, when the motor's running and not running and it's still working, I never stopped to think that it wasn't a supernatural 
episode of Suspense. It's at the very least very ambiguous because in a traditional supernatural element, you would have somehow the organ would kill him. It would play by itself to kill him there at the end. But Didn't it's very... It? It's very clear that the children are in the other room, which is another great bit where you just hear the laughter and the, and clarinet, the, coron- the cornet playing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I think it's ambiguous at best. I took it, is it now. Because, because the kids were <laughs> the kids were made one hundred percent the people who shut the door and locked it. I think you read it both ways, but I chose to read it as and I, a red herring. I never thought about it any other way until you just talked. Mm-hmm. I, to me, that was, yes, this is a ghost story. And yes, the kids are crazy, but wouldn't you be too? <laughs> I also have to guess that if you have a giant pipe organ built into your house, You're a loon. it's going to go wrong all the time. <laughs> I mean, how many times does your garage door go wrong, let alone an entire freaking pipe organ? Oh, it would man. be doing that all the time. If my dishwasher made <laughs> loud noises that ran throughout the whole house. Which is why I always got mad at Star Trek every time they touched a computer and not once did someone say, hold, we got a spinny thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's never a problem. All right. I mean, you're, you're not wrong, though. I do, I do think you can obviously read it that way. Yeah. I'm just saying it never occurred to me at all until this moment to read it any other way. And I think that might be my desire to lean towards supernatural stuff. I like him a lot better. It's, it's not a hard reach to read Ghost out of there. Yeah. No. Any other thoughts? Oh, yeah. Too many, but <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll find it, um, again some praise to Lucille Fletcher for that just quick little paintbrush of exposition at the top about oh you're too pretty to get a job yeah there's mm-hmm. just plenty of rich husbands out there and it has some thematic shades mm-hmm. cast on the whole show but it's really just a little quick comment mm-hmm. but it does a lot of work yeah I don't think this protagonist Amanda would be written the way she was written by a man of this era. She's never hysterical. She's accused of being hysterical. (laughs) She demands the key. She tells Theodore that she won't marry him. She tells him to take this organ out of this house. These (laughs) children are disturbed. She doesn't do stupid things. As the children become more and more disturbed, she starts asking really pertinent questions. Like, well, did they see the body? Have you taken them to the grave? She's very intelligent. And, And she only backs down once things get scary, and to me, it reads as placating Theodore for self-preservation to, like, get out of there. And then she's mm-hmm. freaked out as anyone would be <laughs> yes. freaked out. I was freaked out. Yeah. And the fact that she just wanted to get a job, that it seems like this the whole story is about, <laughs> like, this is what happens when you try to marry for money. And, you know, Lizzie... What a jerk. It's like, she yes. just wants easy money. <laughs> He's like, you marry the crazy guy in the organ house. <laughs> yeah, so there's a, just a lot going on in here. Plus, it's clearly a writer just having so much fun. I know it's a kind of dark story to say that, but I could imagine her at this typewriter going, just <laughs> savoring every little line she wrote. Mm-hmm. And the last thing I'm going to say is, it's a little detail, but it's really nice that this takes place over a month. It starts at April 1st, and I think it ends at May, mm-hmm. May 1st. Just that this is not in a couple days. Uh, Theodore very wisely does not, on the first date, say, <laughs> my children are crazy, and they believe my ex-wife's spirit is in the <laughs> pipe organ. So yeah, there's just so much to love about there's it. There's probably, the, the, at the back of my head, just nibbles on, like, okay, did she actually go to Philadelphia? Did he bribe a brewmaster with a cart to cover the... Or if it just was all a lie and there was like no part of that was true. It's 1900. I, I don't think they're going to call up Philadelphia. I think he's a well-to-do guy and he just murdered her. Because phones up. weren't invented. <laughs> well, <laughs> they, made, they made up the entire... Well, they were. ...story is what I, I take it as. Like, she never left the house. She never did anything like that. And I think Lizzie lets you know how impressed the community is by him. True, And true, I think true. they just gobbled it up. Mm-hmm. And he just had a funeral with an empty casket, or he stuck one of the other murdered women <laughs> in it. <laughs> All right, let's send it to the vote. Uh, I'll start. It's suspense, and I love suspense, and it's never failed me. Honest to God, it's never failed me yet. This is a classic. It's extremely well done, extremely well performed, stands the test of time. Beautiful episode. Thank you for sending it to us. Yeah, it's a classic. I I think I might like this script better than Sirong Number, which we'll talk about at some point in the future, I'm sure. But this is Lucille Fletcher just at her best, I think. And it's mm-hmm. production-wise and performance-wise all supports this great script. Classic. 
Classic. I said more than enough during the body. This podcast is a classic. <laughs> Tim, tell them stuff. Please go visit ghoulishdelights.com, the home of this podcast. You will find other episodes there, including The House in Cypress Canyon, which was our very first episode. It was awesome. It's also a great way of visiting ghoulishdelights.com, that is, to get a hold of us. You can leave a message. Uh, you can put comments on individual episodes. You can click links to get to our Facebook page or Instagram and just let us know what you think. Yeah, you can also go to patreon.com slash the morals and support this podcast. Uh, we've got a lot of cool rewards for people who want to be cool. People still say cool. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not us. <laughs> no. It just sounds false coming out of my mouth. <laughs> you can also go to iTunes and write a review. And speaking of reviews, we recently received a really uh, nice review on iTunes. We have a lot of nice reviews in iTunes. And uh, this reviewer encouraged us to feature more women from old time radio on the podcast. And so we have this episode, which has Ida Lupino and written by Lucille Fletcher. But inspired by that review, I think we're going to do a Lucille Fletcher double feature. Uh, next time, uh, we're going to feature another script by Fletcher uh, from Columbia Workshop called Remodeled Brownstone. Until then, look out! No. Will you come and help us find Mama? I hate children. <laughs> Get them out of the studio. <laughs>